Well, dear friends, let us turn in the Word of God to the Gospel according to John, and uh, we will turn to chapter 14 of John's Gospel, chapter 14. And um, while you're turning to that portion of God's Word, uh, I just want to say what a joy it has been to be amongst you, what an honor it is to bring the Word of God, how amazing it is that God uh, has called um, sinners like us to expound the Word of God, and uh, it's, it's, it is a great honor, and, um, it, and also to spend uh, the, the time uh, with, with our brother, uh, Mr. Baker, and it's been a real joy uh, to spend time with him. Um, my relationship at co college was a little bit different. Uh, we were all over the place on different things and uh, teased each other badly. Uh, now, uh, now we are good friends. Uh, not, that, not that we were not friends then, but I think we pulled each other's legs more, more than uh, uh, we do now. But um, um, if we could turn now to the Word of God and uh, read from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. May God bless this reading of his own precious word. Let us bow before the Lord in prayer. O Lord our God, how blessed we are to uh, have this privilege of coming and hearing the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank the Lord that these are perfect words, pure words, words that penetrate deep, and yet these are comforting words. Lord, comfort our hearts, we pray. This world is full of unrest and war. And, O oh Lord, how this world affects us too, we pray therefore that thy word would come uh, with that, as it were, balm of Gilead, may it come to help us to uphold us, to lift our eyes heavenward and help us to see by faith our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, if only we see his face, how wonderful that would be. If we hear his voice, how transforming that would be. If we experience his touch as he touched the leper and others, how it would change us. Blessed and we pray through the preaching of thy word, communicate thyself to us. For we ask these things for the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, we have been considering the, this account of our Lord Jesus Christ's final night before the crucifixion. 
We would spend some time just being there in that room with the disciples, as it were, just listening in, observing things. And I appreciate the fact that we've only skimmed the surface and just going through verse by verse and just touching on things. Uh, but my prayer has been that the Lord would bless you as you consider things again. The, the Word of God and the, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ is like a jewel that you can keep turning it and turning it and turning it from different angles. You, you see something wonderful. A new ray of life comes, uh, or light comes through. Now, nearly 2,000 years later, dear friends, we are able to listen in to this great incarnate God speaking to his disciples. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ has said before that he has stopped, as it were, speaking to the world. He has dismissed Judas, and now he spends his time comforting his disciples. They are in this upper room together for a few more minutes, as it were, before they will go down into the streets of Jerusalem that night, and they and work their way towards Gethsemane before the Lord Jesus Christ is arrested, before his trial, before his crucifixion. A lot is being packed in um, during that night. So here is our Lord Jesus Christ at the table. Just, just think about that. Peter, he is already interrupted. At the end of the previous chapter, we had seen that. And our Lord Jesus Christ has spoken to him. He has received a rebuke from the Lord Jesus Christ. So the situation is mixed. Mixed feelings is running through. Our Lord Jesus Christ has spoken about his, his crucifixion. He has told them about a betrayer in their midst. Now, the Lord Jesus is now continuing to speak to them. In a moment, Thomas will come uh, in with a question, and the Lord Jesus would answer that question. And, um, and, then, and then Philip comes with a comment. And so the Lord Jesus will continue talking, and then Judas, this is later on, Judas, who is not Judas Iscariot, will also uh, speak. So it's table talk, as it were. They are still in that room. The Lord is at the table. He's giving his time to people just before his crucifixion. Would you do that? Would I do that? We would be concerned about what I am going to be experiencing. But he is thinking of them. That's the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives great freedom to his disciples to speak to him as he speaks to them. He needs to be comforted, we would think. But he's comforting them. So let us observe this evening in the time that we have. And you don't have a clock here. I'm always looking around for a, for a clock. Uh, we have one in our church. And uh, so, so please forgive me if we run into the midnight. Um, I have four things to say. The first thing is... I want to talk about a real danger, a real danger. We see it, a real danger here. Our Lord Jesus Christ sees it, recognizes it, and speaks about it. So first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about a real danger, and the real danger is the trouble in their heart. So he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Now our Lord uh, can see it happening to them. They have been looking at each other to, to find out who is going to betray Christ. There's going to be a possibility of disunity amongst them, misunderstanding amongst them, accusations and trouble in their hearts. I often wonder if we uh, were there, would we see the, the faces change, this trouble come upon them? And, and think about it, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, his spirit is troubled within him, and yet he is saying to them, let not your heart be troubled. He's seeking to comfort them. He's not asking for them to comfort him. Who can comfort the Lord Jesus Christ's heart? No one. Would we be able, as we are looking at the different disciples, see that there is something in their faces, a trouble? The Bible doesn't comment on that. But we all do know, don't we, that often a face which does not look 
troubled, hides a very troubled heart. We can even come to a place like this. We can go to church. We can put on our clothes and uh, dress well and come and smile at people. And when people ask us how we are, we can uh, speak to them in generalities. And our facial expression uh, will not deceive us, will not deceive the people, or it will deceive the people. It, it won't show what's going on in our hearts. So facial expressions do not always tell others what's going on inside of us. But this is the Lord of glory, and uh, the Scripture tells us that He looks right down into our hearts. He knows what uh, we consciously think, but He sees deeper than that. He goes more than our brains and what's going on in our minds, but he sees the heart. Our Lord looks down deep into our character, right down into the very hidden springs and motives. There is nothing hidden from him. It's all naked and open to him. And so he says to them, he sees the sorrows, he sees the trouble, he sees the future, and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Maybe you have come here and there are things going on, you, don't, you can't share it with others. Maybe it won't be appropriate to share with others. There are things that uh, you are not even sure about. What is happening? Well, the Lord knows. He sees them. He sees you. He sees the people bleeding inside. It's not hidden from him. So he sees that here. And he sees not only uh, our troubles, but also how we react to our troubles. So the reaction of these people to the, what's going to happen is a troubled heart. They, they become anxious. They become worried. They are upset. Their disciples were very troubled, weren't they? They're troubled because the Lord Jesus is going to be betrayed. How awful that is. If, if you believed, if your minister came and said to you, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to undermine this church. One of you is going to cause so much havoc. havoc and trouble, and so much offense, so much things that will bring shame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that would startle you. That would discourage you. But, but this is what the Lord Jesus Christ had said to them. They're all terribly troubled because one of them going to, is going to betray him. They are troubled because he told them also that he's going to leave them. He's going to go away and he's going to leave them by, by way of sufferings. He's going to leave them. They've been with him for three and a half years or thereabouts. And can you think of the disappointment of Christ leaving them? They've never seen anything except perfection. Have you ever walked with anyone who's been perfect? You haven't. You don't know what th these were experiencing. You can't actually, and I can't, put myself in the shoes of the disciples. Because we have never experienced. Everybody that you have been with, they have sinned, they have offended, they have been imperfect. But their experience was different. They walked with the Son of God. And this person who is so perfect, everything he said was true and right and good and holy has said to them, he will leave them. Can you imagine how abandoned they would feel? Their hearts are troubled. And then our Lord Jesus Christ told them that Peter, that, that he's going to deny him that very night, three times. Who is the strongest Christian in this place? If you can put your hand up. Nobody does. Uh, who is the strongest Christian in any church? Think about it. If you knew that this is the strongest, godliest Christian in the church, and he was going to deny Christ, not just once, but three times, before the day is out, your heart would be troubled. Because if he is going to do it, what hope is there for me? So they're all troubled. And the Lord Jesus Christ says to them, do not be indifferent to these events. But don't let them put your heart into waves. Do not let your heart be filled with troubles. 
He's not saying that this is not going to happen. These things aren't going to happen. But he says, don't let them trouble you. Don't let them take away your peace. See, in the old Greek world, there were people who were called Stoics. I'm, so, I'm sure you know of them. Maybe some of you are them. I don't know. But, but there, there are certain people who, who, and as it was, it was the case with the Stoics, they said, emotions are not good. Don't show emotions. And it's, it's not only that you, you are not to, um, you should not show it, but that, that sort of stiff upper lip and all of that. And that was my trouble. I don't know if some English folk, some of our folk at, in our church might listen, but uh, they know what I'm like. But um, the, the, uh, it was really hard for me to go back to England because nobody told you what they thought. And uh, you had to really dig deep. And, you know, I used to say, you know, if there's a trouble in your, uh, in your life or whatever, I'm not a mind reader. You need to come and tell me about it, you know. And so I would go and see people. Is everything all right? Yes, everything's all right, without any kind of feelings. You wouldn't know what's going on until the thing, the trouble has now become a big thing. My friends, there, is a, there, is a, um, there was this attitude of the Stoics that you shouldn't have any kind of feelings. Feelings are actually evil. Sadness and joy, they would say that's a weakness. A weakness in our, in our uh, lives. You shouldn't be moved by anything. It's the only way to keep sane, they would say. Well, we are not taught that, dear friends, in any part of the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ wept over uh, the, the sorrows of others, and he wept over his own sorrows. But we are not to have hearts which are all knotted up, hearts which are totally divided in, in turmoil. Uh, we, we don't know where to put ourselves. We are not to lose our peace. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. And so your life, the circumstances of your life, can be, uh, can be so affecting you, and it, they could be so sad and so terrible. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, however terrible it is, don't let that trouble your heart. Don't let your heart be troubled. You can have in, in peace in the midst of the troubles. Don't, and don't rob God of the glory that you could be giving Him because you are so focused on your troubles that you don't give Him the praise. You don't pray to Him in, with joy unspeakable and full of glory or sing His praises with joy that I ha my life is a mess, but I have a great God and I'm here to worship Him. My friends... You might be at times sitting there in front of the fire maybe um, and you're wringing your hands. What am I going to do? But my friends, the Lord Jesus Christ is not sitting over your life uh, and, and wringing his hands and worried for you. Because he knows what plans he has for you. He knows what he has for your tomorrow. Uh, and, and so... And this is why he says, because I know, because I have taken the time and has, I've planned out your life, don't let that trouble you. Don't let this peace of God, which passes all understanding, leave you, but let it fill your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Oh, that God would deliver us uh, from this real danger that we can be in. And it can be very destructive. It can eat away at us like a cancer. And so let, the Lord says, let not your heart be troubled. That's how he starts. And then the second thing he speaks about is the avoiding of the danger. So let not your heart be troubled. He's highlighting there's a danger here. That we could lose out with God. We can lose out with the Lord. We can lose the peace which he has purchased for us at Calvary. And he says, avoid the danger. This is how you avoid the danger. And so he speaks to them and to us about avoiding that. And this is surely one of the most precious passages of the Word of God. And again and again, Christians go to this passage at times of bereavement. Again and again, you, you hear this passage read at funerals and, 
uh, with good reason, too. Because there is that danger of losing our peace and having a storm inside of us. And the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us now how to avoid the danger. So we have to look up to him and we should hear him. He says, you believe in God? Believe also in me, he says. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's making this statement. It's not put in a question form, even though some modern versions put it in a question form. But this is perfectly right translation. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. You believe there is a God, don't you? You believe that there is a God who rules everything. You, you believe that there is a God who... Uh, in whose hands you are. You, you believe there's a God who is good and right, and you believe that there is a God who is pure and holy and wise and just, and you believe that there is a God who loves, don't you? Yes. I believe, someone says, yes, I believe that. I believe that there is a God who rules, but how can I know that he rules with me in mind? I believe that there is a God who, who loves, but how can I know that he, he is working all things out of love for me? I believe that there is a God who is wise, but how do I know that he's dealing with me wisely? Aren't we all so good at fixing problems? You know, if, 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 uh, and uh, situations happen in your life, and you say, well, if it was me, I would do it this way. Uh, well, who are we to say to God how he should deal with our lives? If, if I was God, I would not let this thing happen. I wouldn't let my spouse to die at this time. I wouldn't let this work situation turn out like this at this time. You would have a perfect plan, you would think. But as we think of that, as we... Uh, question these things we are saying to God God I'm wiser than you I would do things differently in my life I would plan my life differently oh my friends let us not think like that the Lord says here you believe in God you believe that he's good and right yes I believe that uh, God uh, uh, that God who is all powerful almighty how do I know that he's working, his power is going to work for me in my situation, in my circumstance, in my troubles? You believe in God, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe also in me, he says. When our faith is in the Lord Jesus, we are in covenant with him. God is over all things, but he is over all things for his church through his son. He, he, God rules the world, but he rules it for the benefit of those who are in Christ. God loves. The, the, the proof that he loves me is that I am in Christ. And everything that happens is an expression of the love of God to me if I am in Christ. So if I believe in God, I am uh, to believe in Christ. And when my faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, I may then know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. His purpose, of course, in Christ. So the Lord is saying, put your faith in me. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then you may have this heart, which is without a storm inside it. Now, we must remember, dear Christian friends, that when the storms came, the boat in which the Lord Jesus Christ was found did not escape the storm. The waves were real. The waves came into the boat. And so we must never expect that. Um, we must never escape the storms of life. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself will say uh, uh, these, uh, in, in, these, in these passages that we are thinking about. Uh, the, in the world, if you read on, in the world you shall have tribulations. 
He will talk to them about persecutions and about trouble. And so the fact that you're a Christian does not mean that you will escape difficulties and awful pains. But if you are in Christ, you may know that all that is part of a loving purpose, everything of it, and only eternity will tell, dear friends. When you enter eternity, all those hard things in your life, you will see God loved me and that's why that happened. The Lord Jesus Christ loved me. I thought he was using this crooked stick in my life. And everything seemed to be crooked. But as Thomas Watson, the Puritan, puts it, God uses the crooked sticks to draw the straight lines. Then it is that you will see the straight lines. So the fact that you're a Christian, it does not mean that you escape difficulties. Even you become more sensitive to what's going on. You'll be filled with awful pain and sorrow by what you see all around us. But if you're in Christ, you may know that all that is part of God's purpose and loving purpose. And you may be delivered from the inward storm, this inward Waves which would threaten to engulf you and wreck you and take away the joy of the Lord and the peace of God and the witness that you are. Oh, to be a joyful Christian in this world, in this sad, sad world that we are in. So we've got to look to him. We've got to look up to him. Then look at verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, he says. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. The old Puritan said, this is the remedy for all trouble. And it is. We are only passing through this world. Thank God for that. Our home is somewhere else beyond this world. And I I come to a point oftentimes in in my life where I think that Christians don't believe in in heaven anymore. They're so concerned about this world and their troubles. It's as if there's no heaven to be had. This is all that we've got. It's, it's rare even to hear Christians talking about heaven today. When was the last time that you really engaged in conversation about heaven? And what is heaven like? And how you desire to be there? And for what reasons do you want to be there? Our, we, we, our home is elsewhere. And it's the Father's home. The Father's house. And we are the children of that family of God. We are not the children of this world. We were once. Once we were in this city of destruction. And our name was graceless. But by the grace of God. We become Christians. Because he came. He's rescued us. And we have a home. It's a place where we stay forever. Forever. It's, it's a house that the door only opens and you enter in, but you can't get out. That's how, that's how it is. You've been in situations like that, you can't get out. But this is, you don't want to get out. You, you want to stay there. You don't, you don't want this to end, and it won't end. The world mansion here is the word for separate places. These are abiding places, resting places. In heaven, there are countless number of places, dwelling places for for souls like us. Designated for each one of God's people. There's a room, there's a space for, for every one of God's people. Our children oftentimes have trouble with their rooms and... Uh, this one's room is, uh, oh, he's got a bigger room. Why can't I have this uh, same size and same place and, uh, and so on? We can complain about so many things in this life. But we will not complain about our rooms in heaven. 
We won't do that. And the Lord Jesus Christ preparing all uh, this, this Father's house, with all these dwelling places, these, the mansions for His people. Do you think that He would prepare a mansion if they were not going to be lived in? Do you think he prepares something, a mansion for someone, and that person never arrives? Of course not, my friends. If you are in Christ, you will arrive. And so the Lord Jesus Christ says to them, do you think heaven is less than a reality? Or do you know in your heart, for sure, it is real? I'm going there. You know, a lady in our church just passed away two weeks ago. She, um, we couldn't communicate to her because of um, her, her health condition. And uh, it was hard to know, actually, what she was thinking. But about six months ago, before, uh, it, while she was still able to communicate, there was a wonderful occasion where she simply said to me, I have peace with God, and I know where I'm going. That was enough. It was wonderful to hear that clear statement. I have peace with God, and I know where I'm going. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking about this. If there wasn't a heaven, he says, I wouldn't have told you. He says, I I wouldn't have let you live under this illusion. And if there wasn't uh, lots of room there, mansions there, I would have told you too. And if there wasn't a particular place with your name on it, Many mansions, a particular place for you, I would have told you. I don't deceive, he says. But because it's true, I haven't been saying anything to the contrary. We can put up, dear friends, with troubles of life because we are of heaven. We can walk into a dark, dark tunnel and be uh, very frightened there if you can see the daylight at the other end of the tunnel. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here. Now now he says, are you grieved about your going away or my going away? Look at verses 2 through to 7. Don't be grieved, he's saying, about my going away. Look, uh, why I am going. If I am going away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you and you and you, he's looking at the disciples. He says, I'm looking at you. I'm preparing a place for you. That's what I'm doing. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. I'm not, uh, I am only going ahead. That's what I'm doing. And where I'm going, you are going to follow, not immediately, as he's just said to them in, in the last chapter, but you're going to follow. You're certainly going to arrive in heaven safely. And you know more than this than you think, he says. You know more than this. Look at verse 4. He says, and whether I go, ye know. But they thought they don't know. But he says to them, yes, you do know. Whether I go, the place I go, you know. And the way ye know, he says. The house is there, and you know which one it is. And the road is there, and you know which one to take. That's how we avoid the danger. Now, some of you, um, dear dear friends here, I'm sure, because it is the same in every congregation, some of you are very much buffeted in your life. Some of you are going through great, great trials, but are you in Christ? The question isn't, uh, what will God do to Take away the buffeting, the troubles. He never promises that, dear friends. Are you in Christ? Do you belong to Christ? Do you have a personal interest in God because you are in Christ? Do you understand that uh, the buffetings are inevitable in this fallen world? Uh, And they are inevitable because it's all part of your, your training, we could say. One day the training will be over. And you'll be home. One day, the pilgrimage will be over. And you'll be home. And that, and, and what w- will take you home 
is the second coming of Christ. When he comes to take you to himself, that where he is, there you may be also. You can go through life. You can go through the next few days, he says to the disciples, and you can go through the years ahead. And some of you can go through martyrdom with these great um, assurances in your life. This truth will take you through martyrdom. This truth is strong enough to take you through anything in this world. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. Now we come to the third point, where there is a contradiction. A contradiction. Thomas now comes with a question. So the Lord Jesus Christ has spoken about a real danger here, about the troubled hearts. And he speaks to them about uh, how to avoid that danger. Uh, but now we come to verses 5 to 7. Because Tom, Thomas is disrupt, uh, interrupting here. Uh, uh, and it's a contradiction. Look at verse 5. Thomas, we read, saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. The Lord Jesus says, you know the way. And he says, we don't know the way. And how can we know the way? Poor Thomas. You see, the disciples were still very earthbound in their thinking. They knew that the Lord Jesus Christ was the Messiah, but they still had these very earthbound ideas about his kingdom. Uh, to which city was Jesus going to go to set up the kingdom over uh, the, the, the Israel? And to which uh, would be his, his capital city where he chased away the Romans and so on. There are people who think like that too today. About, they're all concerned about where Jesus Christ is coming and what he's going to do and all of this kind of a thing. Where was Jesus going to? Was it Jerusalem? Was it Nazareth? Was it Capernaum? Where was it? And if we, don't, if we didn't know where he was going, how could we know the way? So poor Thomas is going through these things. And the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friends, never came to establish that sort of a kingdom. He's already made it perfectly plain that he was go going to say it again. My kingdom is not of this world. Else my servants, he said, would, would fight for me. He would say it uh, this to very, that very night to Pilate as well. And the Lord Jesus, he um, gives him a full answer in verses 6 and 7. But the Lord Jesus says to him, Where I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Now, what was the Lord Jesus' answer to Thomas? It's verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he says. Thomas he says, you know me, don't you? I am the way, and he is, dear friends. Who else is there who is fully God and fully man in one person? So there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By definition, there can be no other way to God because there is nobody else who is God and man in one person. He is the only mediator that we have. No Marys of this world, no priests of this world. Only Jesus Christ is the way to God. He is the way. Who else has made a perfect and sufficient and final oblation, sacrifice for our sins? Only the Lord Jesus Christ, His infinite person, could bear an infinite punishment in, in a moment, and, and He did. So it's by His person, by His work, and, and who else has risen from the dead to be an ever-living Savior? So we think about these things, dear friends. And it's all about Jesus Christ. He's the truth. These Jews, these poor disciples have been living in a world of shadow and sacrifice and priesthood and ceremony and rites. But now here is the substance. It's Jesus Christ. And they, they were surrounded by errors. Errors of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're leaven, the Lord Jesus Christ called it. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. They were surrounded by liars. 
There are false Christs, but he is the truth. Who else can give them a spiritual life? Only Jesus Christ, for he is life. So think about this, dear friends. Let's think about it. Uh, in your Christian life, you can apply it. If you're a Christian, you can apply it. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is the way. Think about that word. What, what is the beginning of Christian life? It's Christ. You come to him and he saves you. What's the middle of the Christian life? It's Christ too. And what is the end of the Christian life? It's Christ. He's always the way. And you could think about it in, in, in all o- other uh, ways as well. How can I be a strong Christian? People ask. How can I be a strong Christian? How can I uh, know God and be strong in my faith? I'll read the Bible, somebody says. But, but what's the point of reading the Bible? Uh, the, the, the Pharisees read the Bible too. What's the point of reading the Bible if you don't find Jesus Christ in its pages? If you're not reading to find him, to know him. What about prayer? You should pray. But what's the use of saying prayers if you don't have dealings with God through Jesus Christ? The whole Christian life, dear friends, is Christ. And there is no other way. And what's the destination? Well, the destination. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but By me, he says. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to bring us to the Father. He came into the world to bring us to the knowledge of God. This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's what he said. We are saved by the knowledge of God. Eternal life is the life of God. It's not something separate from God. It's only knowing God, Uh, it's through that that you have life. He gives you life. The destination is the Father and the Father's house and the presence of the Lord. Heaven is nothing in and of itself. It's because it's the dwelling place of God that that is heaven. And it's because we will be with God that makes it heaven. And he says in verse 7, if ye had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Have you ever met somebody that you, you think you know? You think you know that, that person quite well. And then you discover something. Something completely different about them that you didn't uh, know before. Oftentimes when it happens with me, it's always something bad. Uh, I said something to my wife a week or two ago in, in, about something awful I had done before. I thought she knew, because she no, usually reads my mind. But, um, but that thing, she said, you never told me about that. But praise God, regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, the things we know about him, it's always wonderful. The more you find out about the Lord Jesus Christ, you find something more beautiful, more wonderful, more glorious. And then you say, he's altogether lovely. His fairest among 10,000. And he says to them, you, you've, you've seen me. You've known me. And if you do, you know the Father also. I know these examples we use are poor examples. They had known Christ, and yet they hadn't known him. But now they did, and they would see the Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ has spoken about a Real danger, avoiding that danger. He's answered Thomas's question, and uh, our time is now gone, but I'll just say a few words about the fourth thing I wanted to say. And he makes a comment about his sufficiency in verses 8 to 11. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. It will be enough. And we read this. Verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with 
time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake." So Thomas asks a question, but Philip doesn't ask a question. He makes a statement there. Oftentimes it's, people think that he's asking a question, but he's simply uh, uh, making a statement. He says, show us. Show us the Father, Lord, and it sufficeth us, he says. Wonderful, isn't it? It's, it's something that um, we should all learn, especially ministers of the gospel, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the creator of the world, is so approachable. On the night before he was, he was betrayed. And, and that's amazing. He's approachable. And here is not a question, and yet it's, it's thought as a question. Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. It's sufficient for us. Oh, Lord... This is what Peter, uh, Philip is saying. Oh, Lord, if, if I could only be like Jacob and I, if I could wrestle with uh, theophany, a visible, a visible appearance of God, if, if I could see, if I show us, he says, and if I could say, oh, I would let thee go until thou would bless me, and if I could, uh, if I've seen God face to face like Moses did, if I could only have an experience like that, that would be enough, that would suffice us. That would be all I, I would ever want. Oh, Lord, if I could, if I could walk in the wilderness and, and there would be a burning bush and through it, it's God is speaking to me. And there's a voice that says to me to take your, your uh, shoes uh, and sandals off. Uh, this is holy ground. If I could see the glory of God, his, the, that kind of glory of the cloud of fire and the, uh, and, and the cloud of smoke over the tabernacle. If I could have that experience of Isaiah uh, had when uh, he saw the, the Lord high and lifted up, that would be enough. I wouldn't have any more questions. I wouldn't make any other statements. Yeah, I would be completely fulfilled, wonderfully satisfied. Oh, that's, that's what I want. That's what Philip is saying. And Christ replies to him in verse 9, Philip, I've been with you these years. I've been with you three and a half years. Haven't you understood it yet? Aren't you still, are you still looking for what you already have? I wonder if there's anybody here this evening who is like that. Are you still looking for what you've already got can't you believe what verse 9 says? That in seeing me, you've seen the Father. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Often when I talk to Christians, they're surprised that we, we won't see the Father in heaven. When we shall arrive in heaven, uh, and we never would see the Father. Well, why not? Because... We will see the Father, but you, you only ever see the Father through Jesus Christ. God is a spirit. He cannot be beholden, even in heaven, with our eyes. But we see Jesus. We see him who took on humanity. That's the mystery of the incarnation. How amazing it is. You always see God through Jesus Christ. You, you won't see the Father without Christ. But in seeing Christ, you see the Father. Can't you believe that? Look at verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? He says. Do you not believe it? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? And these are some of the strangest languages in the world. The words are very simple, aren't they? But the teaching here is beyond our understanding, isn't it? I've often used the illustration. It's not a very good illustration. 
uh, where, where a child goes down to the seaside and puts a bucket in the water. And now the bucket is in the sea, and the sea is in the bucket as well. But you know, that's, that's a poor, poor illustration. Because although the, the whole of the bucket is in the sea, the whole of the sea is not in the bucket. But the wonder of the deity is that the, the whole of the second person of the Trinity is, is in the first and the first is in the second. The Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. They're distinct, but they are not separate. When you embrace the Son of God, when you come to trust in Him, you embrace the Father. When you see the Son, you see the Father. When you know the Son, you know the Father. When you enjoy the Son, you enjoy the Father. When you fellowship with the Son, you fellowship with the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way. But He is the way to the Father. And He says, I've been with you for these years. And you're still looking for that Shekinah glory. But the Father dwells in me. You're still looking for that Jacob-like experiences, but you're, you're still looking for the Isaiah-type visions. And for these years, I've been beside you, and you haven't understood. And now you're saying, you're asking for what you have had all that time? My friends, if you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. You don't need anything else. You don't need another extra thing, another extra experience. You have everything in Jesus Christ. And the more you know him, the more you find you didn't really know him. You just find more and more and more and more. Can you not believe that? Do you believe what the Nicene Creed says? God of God, light of light. Very God of very God, begotten, not made. These are amazing words of one substance with the Father by whom all things were created. That's Jesus Christ. And this is why we, you should believe it, Philip, the Lord is saying. The words that I am speaking to you, I do, I'm not speaking of my own authority, he says. So he's at the table. Human lips are speaking to you, Philip. But these human lips are speaking the word of God. But the Father that dwelleth in me doeth the works. The Father who is dwelling in me, but, but I am doing the works. Verse 11, he says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Who can raise the dead? Only God. But a man raised the dead, so that man must be God. Who can open the blind eyes of people who have never seen and never even had eyes? Only God. But a man opened eyes like that. So that, must be, that man must be God. So if you won't believe me just because I am saying this at the table, believe me for the very work's sake. But at least see it, he says. And so with these things I want to finish then, dear friends. Do we need anything else more than the Lord Jesus Christ? There are sadly Christians who are waiting for the next thing. Waiting for, if I just read this book, you know, uh, if, I, I, if I just get this new set of volumes of the Puritans or this or that, and, and if I only listen to a little bit more sermons uh, or, or something else, uh, chasing after men or chasing after the writings of men. Those things are good things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. But if they, we become distracted from the Lord Jesus Christ and be puffed up by our own understanding of things, we haven't le really learned Christ. So friends, there is nothing else any minister can offer to sinners. Only Jesus. He is the only one that we need, dear friends. And this is what the Lord said. I have been with you. And praise God, there are those of you who are Christians for many years. And you're going through life and all sorts of things are happening to you. And, and, and the troubles and the pains and things. But the Lord Jesus Christ says to you tonight, I have been with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then when you think 
And your mind is going and you're so forgetful and you've forgotten everybody's name, even your own name. I will not forget your name. So may the Lord help us then, dear friends, and answer our prayers for tonight. Amen.